Dia sudah jemput Prof. Samadha Dr. Chan Long untuk memberi sepatah dua kata. Selamat pagi. Terima kasih Encik Faiz. Terima kasih juga Puan uh, Susana, Puan Intan dan juga
you have an enema spectroscopy, uh, uh, X-ray crystallography, and this is the uh, resolution. So what this means that the smaller the resolution is where you can distinguish between the distance between the two atoms. Uh, so you can see uh, the distance between maybe a carbon and a carbon separately. So the lower the number, the better. Uh, so X-ray crystallography, you can get maybe uh, 2.8 Armstrong or even smaller, depending on what uh, molecule you are studying. Uh, for crow em uh, it's a bit less compared to X-ray crystallography. However, with uh, the current records uh, for the single particle cryo electron microscopy, I will explain what is cryo electron microscopy uh, in the next slide. Uh, it's basically a, uh, a separate technique uh, that also can uh, provide you information of how the protein or uh, nucleic acid looks like. So the current records, any guesser? What is the current resolution records? Structural biologists in the audience? For crow EM, yes. What's the highest resolution? <laughs> Less than two, definitely. That was broken like maybe four or five years ago. Uh, any guesser? No? So the current uh, highest resolution is 1.2 M strong. Uh, basically, you can do sequencing uh, of based on just the uh, structure of biologies. So you can distinguish based on the site change uh, what is the uh, amino acid of that proteins. Uh, yeah, that's the current res resolutions of uh, cryo electron microscopy. Uh, it's very, very uh, powerful tools at the moment. However, it's very, very expensive. I believe we don't have one in Malaysia. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the operating cost for this machine is uh, estimate about 2,000 pounds per day. So there's around, I don't know, 10,000 or 12,000 ringgit per day. Uh, and this excluding all the consumables uh, as well. Uh, next is also using the same machines, uh, electron microscope, crowd electron microscope is a tomography. And this is where you study a slightly bigger uh, biomolecule where you can start studying viruses uh, and or maybe, maybe a cell or like bacteria uh, prokaryotes uh, where you cut the... So basically, you can grow the cells uh, and then you uh, cut the cells because it's normally if, if it's too thick, you can't put it into the machines. You cut it with a thickness about 20 nanometers and then you put it into the machines, and then you can see uh, the, uh, the, the, the proteins in the cells without purifying it. And, and the next one higher above is uh, light microscopy uh, and or super resolutions. You can also see uh, proteins. So uh, the, the difference between these two is uh, in, in, in the concept, the theory is basically the same. They involve a lot of uh, same algorithms to uh, solve the 3D uh, structures. But the difference is the source of the lights. So in light microscope, we're basically using light. Uh, whereas to retain a higher resolution, you need to change the source of the light into electrons. So basically, this is uh, something to do with the frequency of the um, of the light. I think the light, the maximum, the maximum resolutions. Yeah, with super resolution, you can push up to ten nanometers or 50, if I'm not wrong, uh, but with electrons, the theoretical possible resolutions, although no one managed to achieve it for biomolecule, but they managed to do it for the uh, material science, because material science people also use the same technique. I think you can push it to 0.1 M strong, realistically. Right, so that is some of the techniques. So uh, what I'm doing uh when i was here i'm mostly focusing on uh, x-ray crystallography when i start moving uh, to do my phd in uh, united kingdom i start doing uh the cryo electron microscopy so the workflow uh is still basically very similar to x-ray crystallography you still need to purify the proteins uh however in the cases of cryo electron microscopes uh the concentration of the protein is significantly less. So it's actually possible to do a uh, native extractions uh, from plants, cells, or organs, or maybe even um, 
there's current current trend now is maybe even from a patient cells. So uh, with, with the consent of the patient, obviously, uh, uh, you can extract some uh, protein from the patient cells and study them to structurally, like what is wrong with these uh, proteins in these cells. Uh, basically, yes, you purify it, make sure it's uh, very, very pure, and then, then uh, you freeze it. So there's also a few machines. Uh, so basically, you uh, take one or two microliths and then drop it into a very tiny grid, and then you uh, freeze it with liquid ethane. Uh, basically, uh, it's a very, it's, it, unlike like liquid nitrogen, liquid ethane is used because it frees the sample. Uh, a lot faster than you put into all these machines, the electron microscopy machines. So this machine is about two meter tall, uh, and then maybe one or one meters wide. So it's a huge machine, uh, and it's very very expensive. So basically, yes, uh, crowd EM still require a lot of wet lab sessions. So you purify it, and obviously you want to check that your protein is active. You wouldn't want to solve a protein structure uh, that is inactive unless you uh, aiming uh, to to get an inactive uh, structure. It really depends on your questions. Um, so once you collect the data, the processing is actually uh, equally time consuming. So the wet lab, depending on your protein, how easy to purify, it may take weeks to months or maybe years. But for the solving, uh, data solving as well. Also, depending how easy your sample, if it's a relative uh, routine sample, you can solve it within days uh, or hours. But for difficult protein that's normally in the nature paper, normally take years, two years to solve the structure after data collections. So it involves a lot of processing. So basically, uh, all the software that we are using is in Linux uh, OS. So you do require some basic Linux OS. Now it's a bit more generous. Back then, everything is uh, command line. So basically, there's no graphical user interface. So you literally need to know how to operate it through the uh, terminal. But now it's a bit much more generous. Uh, people have developed very, very advanced and beautiful graphical user interface uh, where you can just interact it through uh, web browsers. Uh, and next thing is uh, you need to have uh, access to high performing cluster. So the data collect from these machines is at minimum one terabyte. So depending on your resolution. So the higher your resolutions, the higher the uh, memory is. So typically it's about 10 terabytes to 20 terabytes. That is excluding processing. So then processing will normally generate another 20 terabytes. So just in your machine, you need to have uh, at least 100 terabytes space in order to process the cry EM map. And it's, it's very relative to your size of the protein. The bigger the size, the bigger the memory as well. So if for small protein, you probably doable in 5 terabytes. But if for size like viruses, uh, it's at least 100 terabytes. Uh, yeah, so storage is always an issue uh, for us. <laughs> So yes, uh, yeah. So here is where uh, you see the uh, balance between the wet lab and the dry lab. So sometimes I spend like a few months in the wet lab. And then when I got my data, I'll spend another weeks to months in the dry lab. So the, I, I kind of enjoy this balance instead of focusing just uh, bioinformatics alone. I sit down and do it and then uh, I, yeah, I kind of like when I get bored, I will just go back to the lab and do something else. Uh, so yeah, I really, really enjoy uh, the, the, the ability uh, where I spend 50% of my time in the wet lab and another 50% of my time in the dry labs. Yeah. Questions? No? No, no. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So uh, this is just... Another a slightly technical slide this is the only technical slide that I have. So uh, just bear with me. So basically just explaining how a uh, cryo electron microscope processing works. So like I said, after collecting, you can spend up to weeks or days, uh, uh, weeks or months uh, processing it. So uh, how we derive uh, the protein structures from the uh, data collection is when you're collecting the data, it's basically like a microscope. You're capturing the image 
or uh, your proteins in a 2D structure, uh, 2D image. Then using um, a Fourier transform, uh, then uh, you can then reconstruct all these 2D image into a 3D models. So what, uh, well, how we do this is when you apply a sample into the grid, the theory was that your proteins will randomly orientate on the grid. So let's say it's a front, and then some of them you have a side image, uh, look at the side, and then look at the bottom. Uh, and then through, you, you get all this different view, like for install this 2D view, and then, then using uh, all, uh, these algorithms, then the computer will then deduce uh, uh, what angle it is, and then you come out of the 3D structure of these uh, proteins. So first you get a 2D uh, image, then you do a Fourier transform, uh, and then you get a Fourier space. And, uh, and then, so basically, oh, sorry. Yes. So you get your proteins, and then when you put, uh, put it into the grid, you get a 2D image. So this is the projection. So this is the one view. Then you get this, then you will convert it into a Fourier transforms. And then the, the theory here, uh, um, what the theory is that the image that you get here, when you do a Fourier transform, it is similar on the intercept of an image of a 3D image. Uh, when you do a 3D Fourier transform, it's a slice of it. So basically, if you get uh, the, the view of uh, this 2D image, the Fourier transform is equivalent of uh, the middle sections of these proteins in the Fourier space. <laughs> yeah, I lost you. <laughs> Basically, yes. Yeah. So when you get the image, uh, when you view it, when you get a Fourier transform, basically that Fourier transform is equivalent of the middle sessions of your proteins. Uh, so it's a slice. And then using that, um, you so that's why you need a different view. Each different view, you get a different slightly middle slice. So it's, uh, then eventually, when once you get all the slices, then you, you get a 3D image of the proteins. And then that is just the concept. Then uh, the, the, uh, in the figure B is um, the iterations on how you get a higher and higher resolutions. So first, uh, you need to have a reference model. Sometimes you use the homolog proteins that uh, already kind of know the structure at low resolutions, maybe around 50 M strong. And then, then you will input this into the machine's algorithms, so they will do a Fourier transform again. So basically, all the uh, reconstruction is done in a Fourier space. Uh, and uh, so you get a Fourier transform of these reference models, and then you will get your image, uh, and then you do a Fourier transform of your image, so this is a 2D image, and then they will start comparing it. So they will find the identical uh, Fourier transform image. They will calculate the differences and they will put a lot of weighting. Weighting means uh, how heavy you want to emphasize of this uh, data. Uh, and then, then, then they would do a reverse Fourier transforms uh, into a 3D format and then reverse to get back your model. And then you keep doing this until you get a high resolution model. Uh, basically, it's mismatching. Uh, so once you get a reference model, it look like this, and then the two D uh, structure will say, "Oh, this look the same." So these two will be together, and then they'll combine it and increase the resolutions, and then they do a reverse transformation, reverse Fourier transforms, and then you get the model, and then maybe you increase your uh, resolution from fifty to twenty, and then you keep doing this, and over and over, maybe around thirty cycles. And each cycle, depending on your resolutions, can take up to hours or days, uh, especially at high resolutions. Uh, when you're approaching like 3 m strong or 2 m strong and lower, it probably take half a day uh, for one iteration. Uh, yeah, so it's very, very GPU intense process. Um, yeah, that's just uh, how cloud EM processing works. Or based, um, mostly on these programs called the Reliance, which is a popular software yeah so yeah you can then deduce uh the uh the structure based on ab initial so uh this uh, iteration process you can also use uh, a different models that 
call it uh, the density volume models where you input all the image randomly. So where you get all the mod, uh, all the site view, and then the machine will kind of deduce each of these a site, and then they will come up with a very rough uh, initial model. Uh, you you don't have to be uh, very specific. Like in in the case of viruses, if you kind of know viruses around, you can just literally put, put a ball in, and it will work. So it's it's very very uh, rough. Like you you don't have to be exact. Like you know that your proteins based on the two D image, it look like a I don't know like a bar. Then you can just put literally a bar. You just generate a three D model of a bar and just put it in. You don't even need a, a reference model. You just put a rough, uh, you think how it look like, and then you just put it in. Uh, yeah, the requirement for the reference is very, very low. Uh, having said that, it's de very dependent on your uh, proteins. So if your protein is a bit challenging, then you want to get a bit more accurate reference models. Yeah, when I mean challenging, it means that uh, your protein is a bit flexible. So there's a region of your protein that is dynamic. Uh, then, uh, yeah, the reference model do play uh, a big crucial role. Or your protein uh, shape look a bit different, uh, which means that most proteins go below. So if your protein is a bit elongated, look like a disc, when you look at the 2D side, just a thin layer, uh, that also struggling. So you want a good reference model because it's, it's important to emphasize that this uh, algorithm is built based on globular proteins. So if your proteins doesn't look very globular, uh, they do struggle slightly and you need to tune the uh, parameters uh, slightly uh, to get that. Yeah. Cool. And one of the benefits of Pro-EM is the visualizations of the dynamics of the protein. So protein is dynamic. And um, it, it doesn't look like what you get in the PDB structure. There is just a snapshot of your proteins. In reality, proteins have to move in, uh, in order for it to uh, work. And this dynamics has been a problem uh, because it's very, very hard to visualize it in high resolutions, uh, how a protein uh, work. Although the time resolve X-ray crystallography is kind of one way to address it, but uh, Proud em enable visualizations of a big complex. So this is ribosomes. Uh, they are huge mega deltons. And you can see uh, the flexibility of these uh, ribosomes. So within the same data sets and using uh, machine learning, uh, you can deduce uh, the motions of your proteins based on the data, the 2D image that you collected. So yeah, this is a very, very powerful technique. And this is where, again, the machine learning come into. So the uh, processing uh, in of the crowd EM structure over the past few years, not only push the resolutions, that's just a one direction, but at the same time, we are uh, focusing on the flexibility of the protein now. So it's uh, doable to uh, visualize a complex uh, that is mega delta sizes uh, and visualize the motions uh, on how, how it works. So for instance, you can just add uh, your substrate and then you freeze it. And then you add your substrate, incubate for like 10 seconds, then you freeze it. Then you can kind of get the process on how your proteins uh, works uh, the whole from the start towards the end. Yeah, so these uh, ion channels, the palm ion channels, the flexibility of the channels. Uh, also, it's worth mentioning CryEM has been uh, making the life of uh, membrane proteins uh, people easier uh, because they are really, really difficult to crystallize in the past, and CryEM just really skipped the step. Uh, and make it a lot easier because it also um, a bit more lipid friendly uh, with the detergents. Right. So that is on the structural biology sites. And more recently, uh, uh, my group in our group in the Cambridge. Yeah, sorry. Yeah.
Ja. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Depend on your resolutions. Once it's beyond like 3M strong, yeah, it's, it's definitely possible to see the binding of a peptide or substrates. Like at the moment, it's kind of popular with the ATP binding site. So you can visualize it to see whether the ATP is already hydrolyzed to become ADP. Uh, yeah, we have the resolutions to visualize it. But the limitations on, yeah, like I said, on your resolutions of your uh, crowd EM map. Uh, so if it's around 3 Armstrong, you can deduce whether it is ATP, and is it hydrolyzed, or is it a peptide, is it a peptide where it bounds uh, in a residue, uh, yeah. Yeah, if, if, it's, if you can go beyond like 2, uh, two M strong, you can even see the uh, transactions of the side chains, not only just the binding, you can also kind of know uh, how the side chain of your peptide binds to the protein of interest. Uh, yeah. Cool. Actually, I'm closing to the end. Uh, so this is a uh, final few slides. Uh, just want to shift the gears to a single molecule analysis. So what I have been explaining uh, on the first brief, previous few slides and what we have um, done in the lab is mostly about assay. So basically in a single drops of your uh, proteins uh, solutions, you have tons, millions of molecules. And then when you do a gel assay, uh, to see the binding or the activity. It's mostly a bulk assay, meaning that if you get a collective of all these enzymes, you put a substrate and then you calculate uh, the uh, products or the changes, uh, uh, hydrolysis of it in the bulk, that means in the population. So that's why it's very important to make sure that it's homogeneous, to make sure that your all your enzyme is on the same state. But uh, in our group, uh, also thankfully, we are working with uh, DNA uh, binding proteins or DNA modifying proteins. It's possible to do a single molecule assay, meaning that you observe a single molecule proteins uh, at a time. So you are observing how this single molecule uh, change in uh, DNA in, in, a, uh, in just one single molecule instead of a bulk. So here is an image uh, uh, it's a, um, a technique called the sea trap by a Lumic uh, company. So it's quite very recent. I think the machine was introduced three, four years ago, and we have one in uh, in uh, in our university in Cambridge. So it's combined a fluorescent microscope, optical tweezers, and microfluorics. So basically, um, the optical tweezers is so here is a two bits. I can see here. Uh, normally is uh, structural, structural bits, uh, it's biotin bits, sorry, yes, biotin bits. And then you can control the distance between these two bits using a laser. So you can pull the, uh, the two bits and or relax it. So what happens is you can, once the, the DNA is bind, so both end of the DNA is biotin uh, labels, it will bind to the bits. And then you can pull the bits and then you will straighten it. And if you continue pulling it, depending which uh, side of the tag, so DNA is double stranded. So if you move four of the tag on the same strands, if you continue pulling it, the protein will start melting, uh, meaning that you will form a single stranded. And then if and then you will start to snap and then uh, it will break. And here is an image where we uh, introduce single uh, strand DNA binding proteins. And then we also introduce some uh, double strand DNA binding proteins. So the double strand is in green, and then the blue is uh, the single strand binding. So you can see that half of it is single strand and half of it is double strands. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of difficult. The melting is a bit difficult. Normally, you have to sit there for like half a day just to get this one image. Uh, it's very laborious at the moment. Uh, so basically, uh, briefly go through how the machine works. So you first you introduce the bits, and then, then you introduce your DNA with uh, where you are uh, in labels. So at both ends, you will start binding randomly to uh, bits. Then you start wash off all the excess DNA that doesn't bind to the bits. And then, then uh, you can then start introduce your proteins. Uh, maybe protein one is a single strand uh, 
DNA binding proteins or double strand DNA binding proteins. And then the second one may be the competitors or a DNA modifying proteins like helicase that will interact. Uh, so you want to see the competitions of this helicase to displace the single strand uh, DNA binding protein or double strand binding protein and then enable it to move. So and all of this protein is frozen labeled, so you can see them um, and moving. So here is a video from the uh, company. So basically, this is the data. You are tracking this protein. This, so this is the beads at both sides. So you are tracking along the time. And then you can see the protein just moving on the double strand DNA uh, mobily, mobily. Then you start introduce the single strand DNA binding proteins. They will bind to the single strand. And then you probably introduce ATP and then some cofactor proteins. And then it starts unwinding the double strand DNA. And then you can start seeing the color changes as well. So uh, uh, normally by, uh, by the binding the green and the red, you turn orange. And then you can see once you introduce the core factor, it uh, starts anchor to the double strand DNA and it mobile and then start unwinding gradually, gradually, gradually. And then uh, when you, sorry. Right. Just give me a moment. So it's currently without introduce the core factor, it's uh, mobile. And then you start introduce the double strand, single strand binding proteins. The reason why we introduce single strand binding proteins is to prevent re -annealing. Most of the time it's just to prevent re because otherwise the protein will start anneal back and forming a double strand uh, again. So, and then we see uh, unwinding. And then normally you can, uh, stop the reactions by adding EDTA or just simply by removing ATP because a lot of these unwinding assays are ATP driven. They are mostly ATP um, proteins. So yeah, I think that's the end of my slides. Yeah. So uh, I hope this is very helpful. So I guess I'll open it for Q&A. Maybe I reverse speed. Eh? Uh, so I think Mr. didn't introduce uh, himself uh, at the beginning, or I also didn't introduce him <laughs> in a way that in a way that uh, many of you may be not uh, knowing him, or some of senior may know. So uh, as I mentioned, he joined 2015, right? And uh, graduated 2017. And he was graduated from Indy before joining uh, in London, uh, about that uh, yeah. And then uh, doing a master, uh, as mentioned, trying to use X-ray photography, but the project actually not working very well. And he didn't got any crystal for his project, for the master project. However, he published two Q1 papers uh, for the master project. And then a also involving a uh, collaboration with a project with uh, Time University, which also uh, published another Q1 data later while he was in uh, doing PhD job. And after finish the degree, uh, the master's, he then worked as a uh, IA yes. for the for the project that we collaborate with uh, multi research or uh, multi research from Cambridge. And before he started his PhD. Uh, so I think uh thank you for sharing uh your journey after you left in Basis and in what you have learned in Europe also in Cambridge and current technology that you are sharing with us. I think it's uh eye opening for us for a week on uh, what you are uh, using for doing this or tackling the research question that you are. You are now interested in. So I, I think uh, maybe I initiate the questions and perhaps uh, we'll continue. So a, perhaps we will be interested to know uh, um, after you 
left or you go to uh, York and also a language. So what uh, will be in basis and prepare you? Maybe uh, I think our student are interested to know. And what you have learned actually in uh, in basis that uh, um, how how you are how confident you are when you are there, for example. Is that what you are interested in as well? Just, uh, just to start. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, like, like Leong said, I graduated in Inti. It, it's not a very heavy research. It, uh, it was a university back then. Uh, I, although they gradually uh, shifting themselves uh, as a research uh, university. Uh, yeah, the Inbus is really, for me, is an introduction into uh, a research wheel where you have to be in the labs uh, and then uh, plan your experiments uh, and do uh, all these experiments by yourself uh, with limited supervisions. Uh, what I found in Inbus is all the machines that we have here is actually the same overseas and especially even newer <laughs> compared to Cambridge. Uh, yeah, well, mainly because Cambridge is an old a university, 100 years, so their machine is, some of them is older than all of us. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the machine here, it's very, very similar. So if you are competent enough to use the machine here, you are competent enough uh, to operate the machine worldwide. So like I said, there's a lot of opportunity outside. Uh, if you just need to build uh, self-confidence. And what Leon said was very uh, true, that the confidence is a bit low when you go there, but then, then you realize you have the similar skill sets and to boost that self-confidence is, is a challenge. Uh, and it really depends um, like, uh, like how you chat with people, how confident are you? Uh, I think for me, it's beneficial because UK is an English speaking country. I'm, I'm quite confident in my uh, English or comfortable, I would say, English is so confident. <laughs> Their English is a lot better than me. Uh, comfortable speaking and also understanding them. Uh, so that's kind of uh, boost the uh, self esteem there. Uh, but yeah, it's everyone have, uh, have their different uh, way of boosting their confidence. But um, yeah, what I learned here is applicable there. And then when I was there, uh, I mostly similarly dealing with uh, purifications. Uh, I, I still remember when I was landed on the uh, UK, I was uh, meeting my PI back then, uh, Brad Ensons. And what funny thing uh, that Fred did was that uh, he said that he will be away for half a year. So when I first just started my PhD and uh, he will be doing a sub article in the United States for half a year, I was like, okay, so who going to supervise me? He was like, uh, okay. So he, he assigned a postdoc to supervise me. Uh, and uh, on the first week, the postdoc just decided that uh, you, you already know what you're doing fortifications, you kind of know it, uh, it's kind of basically hands-off. So basically when I was three years there, it's, it's kind of very hands-off for me. Uh, I'm sure everyone have a separate experience, but um, what I say earlier is, is true. Uh, it's a very self-driven environment out there. York is slightly less. They still uh, pamper you a bit uh, and help you along the way, but it's different in Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and I think Leon gave a similar advice uh, when I was applying my PhD is that uh, if you are not very, very uh, competent, uh, I, I would still believe that uh, Cambridge, doing a PhD in Cambridge is very torturing. Yeah, you really, really have to learn A to Z yourself. There's limited uh, guidance. They treat you really like a postdoc there, even though you are just an undergrad. Uh, yeah. But having said that, uh, if you really do do your PhD in Cambridge and Oxford, it's a, again a different environment. They have these college systems. Uh, uh, the and then once you leave the university, you become the alumni of uh, the Cambridge and uh, Oxford, and that alumni card is kind of powerful. You can enter in, uh, out of the library. Uh, and they do treat the alumni really, really, really well, uh, mostly because most of the alumni is very successful and tends to donate back to the university. That's why they are so rich. Uh, but yeah, so 
like I say, self-driven, but what I have learned here really, really helped boost the confidence, especially when you go there and then you realize the machine is the same that you have been using for the past three years. Uh, so uh, yeah, the confidence that, right. <laughs> <laughs> right uh i'll i'll address to the uh first question first yeah like i said self uh, self learning is important i do spend i i do like set a limit like hopefully once one paper, one journal per week. I also subscribe to all these alerts. Uh, it will just pop out if I ever does. Mm -hmm. So you basically can subscribe uh, journal alerts with, I don't know, Science Direct, NCBI. If there's a new paper, they will just pop up uh, and then he email it to you. There's a new paper uh, related to what you are searching. Uh, yeah, so a lot of learning. However, normally in, in uh, at least in the UK, uh, a lot of people are working in a similar field. So normally we also have a lot of coffee break there. And uh, during the coffee break, people tend to bring up like, uh, this is an interesting paper. Uh, have you read it? <laughs> it's very, very competitive as well. Uh, like normally just one day came out and then the, the people start asking you. Uh, another good culture that we did there, there is a journal club. I'm not sure you don't know why it's journal club. Uh, basically is uh, you assigned uh, a students or a postdoc or PI uh, where during the group meeting, uh, they, they will uh, find a very interesting paper and then they will present uh, it for instance inside of this audience. So when I was in York, uh, the department that was, I was is uh, structural biology departments. Every week we have a journal club. So basically every Wednesday, after lunch, everyone will sit down here and then one PhD student or postdoc will start pre uh, presenting a paper uh, that released maybe a few months ago or a few weeks ago. And then they'll criticize the paper. So when you read the paper, you shouldn't take it 100% because not everyone uh, reports uh, accurate results and all their interpretations might be slightly different. So that's where you start having a critical thinking uh, because like I said, the audience include like PIs, like some of the PIs, eight years old, and their view is, of course, based on their experiments, uh, what the experience they have, their view is very, very different and the critical of the paper is slightly different. So there also you start learning the way of thinking, how to interpret a different, slightly differently. Also the experiment design slightly differently based on what people have done. Uh, and also there also we do a sharing session as well. So um, I, I think it's something similar here with the progress report. So it presents the work, but there the postdoc do present the work as well. Uh, but PI is like, I don't think PI present, no, less, on, only the postdoc. Uh, and then, then uh, yeah, so self-learning uh, and then interact with people. That, uh, that's how uh, we learn about the latest paper. I also tend to subscribe. Uh, it's it's quite uh, popular now currently, especially for the in the in the Western world about the outreach uh, program. So a lot of the scientists do have Twitter accounts or social media accounts, and they do, do post their work, uh, especially their new uh, journals work. And then if you follow them, you can kind of know uh, what is the recent discovery that that lab that you are interested on are doing uh sometimes they also will retweet uh, some of the other people labs uh, for your second question is of the paper so crystallography is uh how to say um you still purify the proteins and I, as i said uh, earlier you still do all the wet lab uh, actually to make sure that the enzymes is active 
Uh, and you could also do uh, mutagenesis based on the prediction model currently like with alpha four. So I still do all the wet level, but we just a slightly extra I'll try to solve the structure. And that is uh, probably uh, use up most of your proteins. So despite what Leon said, we didn't achieve the, our initial model of uh, crystal, uh, crystal structure of the enzyme. We still do a lot of uh, enzymatic assay that is already sufficient enough for us to publish. Uh, if, if you manage to get a crystal, you will just a, a, a much more bonus uh, into the uh, paper to uh, kind of make it much more representative. Uh, so uh, yeah, based on what we have done and then with some mutagenesis assay, like I said, with all this prediction model, you can kind of deduce which residue that's crucial in the active site. So using that, uh, we managed to publish one or two uh, paper. The another paper is a collaborations with uh, some groups, uh, and then that was on, on another crystal structure. Uh, that protein is by itself is uh, is a toxic. So uh, toxin. Uh, so it's an extracellular protein, and extracellular protein tends to be quite stable. So yeah, that was. I I would say that was kind of like a, a gift. It's it's quite a smooth project. I would I would say I'm not sure whether Leon agreed, uh, but yeah, at that time, uh, and it was fortunate we get it out before the alpha fold. Probably will be struggling slightly with uh, all these advancement in structure predictions. By that time, it, it was yeah. It's, I would say that is kind of game. So luck does involve slightly in your experiments. Uh, but the most important thing is make sure you record everything. Sometimes you make a mistake, you see a weird result. It might be good, it might be bad, but the more, most important thing mm -hmm. is whether you can reproduce it. Uh, but just make sure you just write down everything you do. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, a lot of the PhD positions, so there's two ways of uh, PhD positions. So uh, firstly, you can uh, inquiry. So for instance, you have a lab that you're interested in US or UK or Europe. You can inquire the uh, PI. Uh, so you write letters, and actually, we do receive uh, uh when well at least in Cambridge, uh, uh my PI do receive a lot of email actually on a daily basis, uh, to do a PhD uh, internship, summer internship, uh, as well as postdoc. So it's actually you you have to have the initiative. So if you know there's a group that you are very very interested, you can inquire it. So but do make sure your inquiry email is very very uh how say formal and informative. So you could say something like I'm doing my study here, i interested in this, I bump into your journal, and then do describe it, or the journal, do just read the title and abstract, and then say, I'm interested on your paper, uh, that's definitely a no-no. Uh, yeah, do, do say, like, I found your journal is slightly interesting, and I want to do a PhD with you, or internship with you, uh, if there is uh, funding, some will respond, some will not, it really depends, but without trying, you will know. And another side is uh, for the funding uh, PhD, a lot of the requirement in UK now is that you have to advertise the uh, funding positions now. So, and uh, you could then, once they advertise it, it will go through a formal process where it's just a website page, you have to upload a, uh, certain things or, uh, and then you start applying. But normally we, we, they still encourage you to uh, write inquiry uh, uh, emails to the PI that you're applying to this, despite them putting it uh, outside uh, in their uh, web page. So do inquiry saying that you are here, here, here. And then the, a lot of people tend to like to do an a informal uh, interview. So through a Zoom, you say that I'm interested to apply a PhD, fund a PhD that you advertise. Uh, and then uh, start negotiating uh, or chit chat. Uh, yeah, so it's, yeah, like I said, you just need to search for it. There's a lot of funding position out there and just need to find the right ones. Uh, yeah, another option is, yeah, you get the PhD programs that the uh, PI willings to host you, but then, then you apply the scholarship separately, probably uh, from your governments, like uh, uh, from, uh, from Malaysia governments. 
for from a company. Uh, so they do we do get a lot of uh, scholarships from AstraZeneca uh, because they tend to like to do industrial uh, project with uh, uh with or well, at least in Cambridge. Well, we do have it in York as well. Uh, yeah, and then that's where uh you get some funding from the industrial. Yeah. Industrial partner tends to uh, increase their funding to academy recently, which is a good thing. So you too, you can search uh, PhD slightly differently. So if you are interested into industry, you can actually go to a, a pharmaceutical website. Uh, a lot of them do have PhD program uh, internally uh, from the pharmaceutical company, and you can apply there. Uh, yeah, and they pay really well. <laughs> No, no, yeah, yeah. So uh, I got these scholarships in York. So when I uh, chat with Fred, the, uh, my my PI, uh, my PhD PI, so I was offered uh, open letters. Uh, uh, basically, means that um, uh, I they offer me positions, but it's not funded, and uh, provided you meet the requirements, uh, you still have to do all these English tests, IELTS, which is a requirement for UK uh, international applicants, as well as some um, certificates like a master or uh, undergrads or bachelor degrees. Uh, then we, uh, with the help of Fred, uh, my, P, uh, my PhD PI, uh, we apply with the university scholarships um, uh, and then to write a long statement here, yeah, apply for it, and then waited for a few months and then i managed to secure uh, a scholarship there but that was just a tuition fee waiver and then again like i said uh, luck does involve probably it's faded uh threats do uh helps kind of partially sponsored my stipends so from the uh grants uh and uh we, so that's how i received some stipend from threats I'm very grateful to you this day. Um, but yeah, so the tuition fee was uh, from the university scholarships where basically they wave off the tuition fee. Uh, it's very expensive there. Uh, and the stipend is from my PI funding. Yeah. Yes. Ah. That is, I, again, uh, I think fate do play a role. So uh, at that time, I it was I was writing it, writing it. Uh, and then because my stipend was finishing, so I still have half a year, it's three years stipend. That means that uh, after the end of the three years, you don't get any money you left. Uh, we, so Fred do uh, send an email. So he received an email from my uh the, the Cambridge PI uh because they are uh, both of them are welcome welcome fellowships so they know each other uh there is a uh, positions available uh and he sent an email asking if there is a uh, suitable candidates they are interested on doing a uh, postdoc with him so at that time it was about I think eight months before I submit my thesis. Yeah, that was February. I submitting on September. Yeah, it's about like seven, seven months ahead. Uh, and I wrote an email and we had an interview. And then uh, after a few days, uh, he offered me a position. So basically, I just applied once. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 a very uh, I I did say it's a bit does. <laughs> play a role sometimes uh, if you are lucky and uh, your PI do see, uh, uh, do receive. So because a PI there do get a lot of emails uh, and they do communicate among themselves whenever they have an opening. And not only that, when I was in York, we tend to receive a lot of uh, forwarding email from the departments on the opening positions, either in the uh, university itself or outside as well. So uh, that's, like I said, that's actually a lot of opportunity outside there. You just need to be ready to grab it. Uh, but yeah, I only applied once and, and yeah, everything was quite smoothly. Then I applied work visa and then, yeah, I start like work two weeks after I submitted my thesis. So it's like boop, boop, straight away. Uh, and 
that time I haven't did my Viva. I did my Viva after my post talk. Yeah, after I started work. No, uh, I don't think so. No. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you can see my uh, white hair. <laughs> uh, I do. Yes, yes. That, uh, yeah, lifestyle. Uh, yeah, uh, work-life balance is a big thing at the moment. Uh, I think has been, always been a big thing uh, in the past in UK. So yeah, the work-life balance that is really, really uh, good. So whenever you chat with people, uh, normally, like I said, 50% we do talk about work, the current research, keep up to date. Another 50% is actually the, their personal life. Uh, it could be families, if they have daughters or some, or with their pets, talk about their pets. Uh, about their trips overseas uh, or their hobbies. So 50% of them and politics. And yeah, politics is uh, also a big topic there. So you may want to keep up to date with uh, the UK politics uh, because otherwise you out of the loop. So yeah, they, they do have a very good work-life balance. Normally people left the lab after six. Um, and they start their work at nine. Uh, they are very productive. Uh, and uh, yeah, do some people do stay uh, when when it was required. Uh, but overall, they do have very good work life balance. When they work, they really focus. It's like fifty percent of the people in the lab are wearing a headset. That means it's a signal that uh, don't interrupt. I'm working. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I can't. Side grant. I don't really catch your question. Sorry. Beside my grant, yeah. Research grant, yes. Oh, okay. So the research grants, uh, normally uh, you have to apply it either through fellowships. If you want to have your own research grants, normally as a student, there you don't tend to have your own research grants. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is answering your question or I misunderstood your questions. But normally, if you want to apply for a research grant uh, through the company, for instance, the uh, uh, pharmaceutical company, normally you apply as a fellowship. So basically, uh, you you uh, arrive and then you submit your CV and then if there is an opening, uh, you will go through an uh, interview process. For the company, it's a bit more long. I normally involve five interviews, uh, depends. Uh, but yeah, so if a with company, you have to apply as your own fellowship if you want to have your own research grants. Yeah. Internet. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes. So uh, internally, uh, we do have research grants, but it's not very common. Uh, and most of the research grant is mainly for uh, different disciplines. So for STEM, uh, science and technology, uh, and like biomedicals, uh, it's not very common to apply a research grant separately uh, unless you apply for a research fellow. Most of the research grant uh, is slightly smaller, like 10, 10,000, 20,000, and they are only available for social uh, studies, like history, uh, philosophy, social science, uh, where it's struggling to uh, receive uh, uh, scholarships. Because for uh, biomedic, um, at least in, in UK, uh, biomedic, uh, most of the experiment is expensive, uh, including the reagent, the machines. So most of it is fun and most of it is funded by the uh, government funding or charity funding or even the uh, company funding. Uh, so the, the Cambridge don't tend to provide a scholarship for science and technologies uh, students. 
they normally only even for postdoc they don't offer it they do offer it uh, for uh, social science as a site so for instance you already been there uh, you can apply for a small amount uh, five thousand uh, pound and then to do a, a survey because a lot of the social science to do a lot of surveys uh, kind of stuff yeah it's, it's not very common the most common one is apply as a fellowship so the uh, university uh, itself also have a lot of fellowships uh, uh, positions but that is with the college I'm not sure how familiar you are with Oxford and Cambridge college systems but basically they do have it's, it's kind of similar with UK uh, UKM here you have all these college 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 but there the college is have their own money some of them, the most rich one can work up to like millions. So they do have internally have some money and then they do sponsor uh, fellowships internally for you to work in the university. Uh, that is a bit more common. It's a bit less common to apply a grant for your research uh, separately if you are working in science and technology. I hope I answer your questions. Yeah. Based on your knowledge or based on yeah, so the questions, uh, it will based on your knowledge if you put it in your CV or is something that you are, a journey, if, for instance, if you have a paper, you are the co-author, then they will ask technical questions about what you have done. So that, that part you want to make sure if you are a co-author of paper and you do put it in their CV, they will read it. Uh, be sure about that and then they'll ask it from a to z the technical questions so even though you are only involved with part of it you want to make sure that you understand the whole paper uh yes so that's for the technical questions but most of the time it's much more uh inspirational they want to see a way of thinking uh and they will ask questions like if i give you one million what how you will spend it for your research plan your project so on the spots Give me an answer. A lot of that is much more inspirations. They want to see your way of thinking. Uh, it's a lot less on your knowledge. Uh, yeah, it's on your critical thinking uh, stuff. And uh, yeah, and also a lot of typical questions like what is your strength? Why you? Why you? Uh, why you? Is your? Uh, how say? What you see? You benefit. Uh, the benefit that the company want if, if we recruit you is it's a bit more technical. Uh, much more general career uh, interview questions. Yeah. Yep. Sorry? Uh, no, not personally, but uh, mostly from, uh, I, I, I'm I just a passenger. Uh, I haven't done the punting yet. Uh, it's, yeah, I haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, that is a good question. I, I, like I said, uh, there's a lot of faith involved. Uh, uh, when I was in biosis, I kind of like work and then try to understand what I'm doing here. Uh, and I say it's everything uh, that I learned here uh, really applicable when I always see this. If you ask how I would do it differently, Obviously, it's my experiment designs, uh, project management, because now I'm much more experienced. Obviously, I was slightly twinned it a bit. Uh, probably will finish it slightly earlier, that kind of stuff. But I think I'll tell my young self I'm doing quite well, actually. Uh, everything will be all right. Work hard if, you, uh, if you're really passionate about it. I, I am really, really passionate about uh, research life. Like I said earlier uh, in my high school, I have always uh, interested on all this uh, research and always wanted to be, and I really work towards it. Um, and I really enjoy my current life there. Uh, about whether you say stress, stress definitely is there. Uh, it's, everyone is very capable of, uh, in, in, in uh, Cambridge uh, and uh, you really have to know your stuff. There's no talking shit. They will know you are telling shit. Uh, but yes, uh, yeah. So you really need to know your stuff uh, and uh, yeah, be passionate. Uh, everyone there is passionate, yeah.
Thanks again, uh, for your very generous sharing on what she had he had learned and his experience. And I think uh at least free to be contacted, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can search. I mean if if yeah, you can search me. <laughs> So let's thank uh, uh, Kishin again. Yes. Come and visit us whenever you are uh, coming back to visit. Yeah. Because he, he has, he's having a five years contract over there. So it will be a few more years over there. And shall we take a photo or?